Hello everybody, um, thanks Marcin for your kind introduction. Uh, I'm Stefano Mariani and today I will deliver this talk in place of, on behalf of Franco Zambonelli that has some uh, health uh, problem. Um, so this talk is about the concept of self-development, which is somehow borrowed from cognitive psychology and sociology, and its application to mostly collective system, because for individual system, uh, there are so many things already going, going on. Um, so basically, we will um, first of all motivate why taking care of self-development or autonomous self-development is, is relevant. Um, and that the role it could play in, in, in autonomous systems or systems having some decision-making capability on, on its own, on their own. Uh, and then we will uh, a bit of uh, review the, the key concepts that are involved with the concept, at least in our uh, opinion, mine and, and, and Frank's and, and colleagues, uh, the key research areas that are involved, and then mm, a bit of, of some of our uh, preliminary work we are doing in this in this field. Um, first of all, well, um, the, the, the world as it is today, it is more and more connected. We already know this. Every paper begins with this sentence, more or less. Uh, Internet of Things is starting to gain traction everywhere. Um, the vision of pervasive systems is, is gaining really a, a hold on the in the real world. And we are basically getting acquainted of having our mediation with the world, uh, our interaction with the world mediated by uh, by devices and by AI, uh, mostly. So sensing the the, the 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 environment and everything, every information that is useful, for instance, to a personal assistant that is running on your on your smartphone, and then uh, suggesting things, uh, proposing actions to to affect the world. Um, however, mostly in, in, in the real world, um, the so-called smart systems are, are doing the, are, are developed this way. Um, there are some devices that sense the environment. There is a, a, an analysis phase, a data processing phase, and then something is proposed to a human basically, which is the one who has a goal in mind and then decides how to act based on the useful or not useful suggestion that it gets from the from the system. So um, basically the, 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 the state of art in, in, the, in the real world is that there is always a human in the loop that has to make the decision. Most smart systems just provide you with, I don't know, a dashboard for monitoring what you what you care about. Um, instead, the, the, the step that we, we, we want to make and we are making in many fields is that uh, is that of removing the, 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 the human in, in the loop or at least not having it, uh, the, the, such a human mandatorily in the system. The system should work even without a human because the system has been endowed with a goal has been delegated by by the human and then there should be some kind of decision process on behalf of the human that is able to figure out goals and to to, to plan actions accordingly to understand the situation as a human will do these kind of systems are uh, everywhere as i said um, cities are, are are becoming more or less smart depend on where you live but um, traffic uh, management, for instance, is already becoming a bit smart with, with uh, green waves synchronized between, between traffic signals, adaptive traffic signals that extend or shorten the duration of the green signal, depending on the incoming traffic. Autonomous cars, obviously, are an example, but also um, homes uh, and, uh, and, and, above all, uh, industries in which you can have uh, plant automation control, which can get pretty sophisticated in fault tolerance, in fault diagnosis, in, in monitoring the whole plant functioning. Um, obviously, the, the, the goal for the human being and for us as developer is, is always the same, is to 
just not have to think too boring things. Like, um, personally, but the only reason I want uh, to see autonomous cars sooner than later is that um, I don't like driving. It's boring driving in the city. Maybe driving on a nice highway on the on the Amalfi Coast could be could be entertaining, but driving in everyday traffic is very very boring and stressful. So I don't want to do that. And, and I will be glad if a, if a machine, if an AI could could take care of this. Uh, so that's basically the the goal. Um, but there are a few a few uh, questions, a few issues that we must um, deal with, uh, and it's not something something new. Um, when you have a complex system, you 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 as a designer of the system will naturally try to figure out in advance all the possible uh, states that the system can be, all the possible situations that the system can face. But in some system, this becomes impossible. Uh, Autonomous driving yet again is another example of this. You can't possibly hard code into the into the AI all the possible traffic situations that the car has to deal with. So uh, it is obvious that for some system learning is not a, a nice feature to have, but it is more of a of a requirement. Um, and for instance, in in recent times we have seen remarkable success in 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 the the specific machine learning, which is reinforcement learning, where you don't need some uh, supervised data, some labeled data, uh, ready ready to use data to to train your AI, but you let your AI interact with an environment, usually a simulated environment first, if you are in a critical scenario, and you have this agent. This is interacting with the environment basically by trial and error and understands uh, which are the most uh, correct actions based on the state. Um, and doing this for every possible state, or at least for the state that the agent can visit during its learning, uh, actually builds uh, a policy, a behavioral policy for what the agent should do in every situation. And all the situations are unforeseen to some extent in this in this case because the agent knows nothing in principle about about its environment um, there are many scenarios besides games where this works in, in robotics for instance is very is very successfully applied in in, in um, <coughs> and um, there are however some 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 shortcomings of this approach. For instance, um, if you want some guarantee of, of, of having the, the optimal policy learned, uh, or you if you want some guarantee of working somewhat good, um, you need to have a, a specific, let's say, let's say, uh, some specific properties of the environment. For instance, the environment should be stationary. There shouldn't be um, uh, too complicated dynamics in the in the environment. The transition system that resembles the environment should be the same uh, in all steps, but this is not the case many times in in real applications. And the usual set of of big challenges for uh, also for any other AI application that is how to generalize to unseen situations and how to transfer learning from one domain to another because even reinforcement learning is something that is usually very domain specific. You train your agent for a specific task or for a specific goal. Um, yet we are starting to see some success, obviously by deep, by big players using deep learning with lots and lots of horsepower and basically money. Um, but at least we are starting to see that having a sort of generalist agent able to take to undertake different tasks um, is possible, is feasible, at least in principle. So the, 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 the transition that this kind of, of, of methods in AI, uh, such as reinforcement learning, will enable is that of uh, moving from, from uh, systems, smart systems, so-called smart systems, in which 
uh, you have uh, a predetermined set of goals and 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 uh, and tasks you want to achieve uh, to a situation in which uh, these goals could be even uh, plugged in and in, in 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 real time because the system is able to to learn how to achieve these goals and not only the system should be reactive to new goals but also should be reactive to changes in the environment if i um, i don't know if i move abroad for for some period to visit another university and maybe i bring some smart device i have in my home i would like that the smart devices will reconfigure themselves to my new accommodation uh, after after maybe uh, a few days so or so, so to to adapt to a relocation of the of the devices anyway anyhow um, that, that to actually be smart, we would like for an autonomous, a truly adult, autonomous systems to be able to adapt both to uh, what is coming uh, from the bottom, so the environment, sensors and actuators, and both uh, to what is coming from the from the top, from the user, from the applications. Okay. And obviously, we want to do this. Uh, for systems composed by many agents, many subsystems. This is the actually one of the newest challenges for, for, for instance, for, for AI and for reinforcement learning, acting in a cooperative or competitive setting where multiple agents are, are learning all together, possibly with, with different tasks. Maybe they these tasks have positive dependencies. They must be accomplished in a certain order to achieve an overall goal, or maybe they have negative dependencies. They are hindering each other. So basically, this is the 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 the, the context in which we move. Um, what do we need to achieve this kind of system? What do we need to achieve this kind of of autonomy? Both individual autonomy in in the sense of a, a single an individual agent that is able to act in the side on, 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 on its own, but also at the collective level where many agents may need each other information to work properly uh, as a collective. And this is basically the whole idea behind uh, self-development or autonomous development applied to, to computer science. Um, and it has a very strong inspiration to what uh, babies do actually. Um, babies learn gradually to do different things that we try to frame in this uh, in this itemization and in the upcoming uh, upcoming picture. Um, first of all, they 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 need to understand what they what they can affect in their environment, how their actions can can change the environment. What if I touch this? What if I grab that? Uh, once they have this basic, we will call it sense of agency, they can act, uh, they can start accomplishing simple, simple tasks, and then they can start pushing goals. Um, actually, I have a, a baby, uh, she's eight, eight months old, and um, she's starting just, just, just now, I mean, uh, if she wants something, she just learned that she has to first move toward the object, then grant the object, and then do whatever she wants, which usually is eating the object. And and then the baby starts to to develop also the, the sense of uh, of collectiveness in a sense. I mean, they start understanding that there are other people, other active entities in the environment. Um, and then they, sh they start uh, understanding and learning how to behave in the presence of others. Uh, what if I want my mom to feed me? Uh, I just cry. Okay, so the babies really uh, undergo all this, uh, this kind of self-development uh, stuff. And here is a possible depiction that we that we uh, come up with to to give an idea. It is obviously it is a, 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 a never-ending process um, that starts in a sense with embodiment and perception. You need to first become aware of what you can do, what are your actuators basically, and what you can perceive 
from, from your environment. So what can your sensors do? Then you can start to build a sense of agency when you actually try to experiment with your actuators to see how they change the values reported by your sensors. After this, you can start uh, to act in a goal-oriented way. Okay, I understood that if I uh, switch on the lights, the luminosity level of the room goes up. A very basic thing. Um, and then, from this point onwards, so self and non-self strategic thinking, uh, you need the, the collective level because only in the presence of other you hear, you realize you can realize that you're not alone. If you're alone, you don't need this this this, this second loop. Uh, but if you're not alone, as in many systems today, um, you need to understand what you can do and what you cannot do. And then you need to start learning how to strategically think about others. Um, okay, what if I want to achieve this? Maybe this other agent is doing something that hinders me, and then I must understand how to act based on how he is acting. Then you can start developing communication skills and coordination skills up to the, let's say, the highest level of this self-development, which we believe on the on the collective level to be the the emergence of some institutionalized means to 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 act in a in a society of agents. And there are many approaches that have something to do with this, with some of the steps we have seen in those in that in that group. Here there are just a few. Uh, uh, there are just uh, some examples. Uh, for instance, if we focus on this kind of trend in, in basically under the umbrella of, uh, of reinforcement learning and some more recent nuance of it, um, there are many things that resemble this self-development stack. For instance, the idea of curriculum learning of uh, more recently of autocurricula. The idea, the whole idea of curriculum learning is basically to let an agent first learn simple tasks. And then when these are acquired, when there is a satisfying policy that knows how to achieve these simple tasks, then uh, start switch to more complex ones. Okay, this is basically the, the, the whole idea behind curriculum learning. And it's very effective. And, and the idea of how to curriculum instead is when you put this agent, curriculum learning can be applied to a, an individual age, agent, uh, the whole idea of how to curricula is what if I put this agent between other agents? And maybe these other agents are using curriculum learning too. Well, basically what you find out is that both in competitive and collaborative settings, uh, a sort of curriculum emerges because if I learn to do some, something, if I improve my learned policy, it is highly likely that other agents will also improve their policy because I improved mine. So maybe they, their task is not so easy to achieve anymore and they need to, need to improve their, their learned policy. So this is the whole idea of auto curriculum. And there is a very, um, very catchy, let's say, uh, uh, video on this, uh, a, a very catchy result achieved by, by uh, deep mind with this uh, kind of hide and seek uh, game. I don't know if you if you already seen this, but uh, go and check it out because it's very interesting. Um, basically, here is a, a, there is a collective of players playing hide and seek, and they develop uh, different strategies to move objects and defend against the uh, the other team. And, and and this is a very nice representation of of what uh, an auto curriculum. Uh, is because here agents are, are just given the task to uh, red agents should find the blue ones and the blue ones should not be found by the by the red ones. That's it. Obviously, they have some kind of reward uh, depending on the action they do. But all the strategies you see, so moving blocks to block uh, doors, uh, moving ramps to go beyond walls, is 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 everything that uh, all of these uh, abilities are learned with with this notion of. Of an auto curriculum. Um, also, on the collective level, there is there is um, there is some work going on. Uh, if you look at all these 
thread about uh, norms, uh, uh, shared rewards, and, and stuff like that. Uh, what we notice is that, especially in the reinforcement learning literature, but in general in the in the machine learning literature, um, you assume there is no communication amongst agents. And this is especially true for game theoretic settings, if you study the, the, the problem uh, from a game theoretic perspective. Uh, but, I mean, this restriction is um, even too limiting for, for many real-world uh, real scenarios in which instead you want your agents to, to communicate. And uh, when you want your agents to communicate, um, you can apply the same reasoning you apply to, to achieving tasks. Should communication skills be uh, an innate capability of the agent or, or, or can we learn it? Um, so you can start wondering if your agents are able to, uh, sorry, there is a duplication here. <coughs> um, so you can start wondering if your agents should could, um, understand how to behave and how to act in a, let's say, uh, institutional way, uh, following some social norms or convention that has, have emerged uh, in the system. Um, and again, here you can apply the same the same reasoning you've done before. Can we learn what is the correct way to behave collectively as a collective um, in a given system to achieve um, given global goals? Um, and if even here there is there is some literature on on norm emergence, not not too much, but uh, there are works trying to deal with this with this issue. And lastly, we put in this whole picture of self-development um, the, 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 the keyword causal. Uh, we believe this is very crucial and only recently started gaining traction in the machine learning areas. Um, and basically, the idea is that with most of machine learning techniques, your AI only learns associations between things, between data. But this is not enough to act uh, in the real world, or, or at least to deliver guarantees about whether you are acting in a purposeful way toward the goal, or you are merely acting in, in that way because you learned that on this situation should correspond this output. Um, and this is also where we already did some, some, uh, some preliminary work. So uh, here is where we talk about what we did in this, in this direction. So basically we, we are working in two directions. One is to try to have a software agent able to develop a, a sense of uh, a causal model of the world that he is living in. And the other direction is um, how to teach uh, an ensemble of agents to, uh, to communicate, in, in our specific case, to communicate via, via uh, mediated communication means, such as pheromone deposit. Um, first of all, uh, for the causal part, uh, let's say we have an agent that has access to a set of variables and that can uh, also do a set of actions. Uh, you can see this easily as a set of sensors perceiving values and a set of, of actuators enable, enabling you to affect the environment. Um, basically, our task is to build a causal model of this. So to understand uh, what are the relationships between all these variables. So which actions affect which variables, which variables are linked to each other. So for instance, I don't know, if I increase the luminosity of the room, uh, maybe also the temperature uh, increases a bit because I don't have, uh, I don't have LED uh, lights, but old lights that, that, that warm it up when, when, when they were, when they were on. Uh, so this is what we want to build. And this is the, 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 the basics of a causal model, okay? 
this is the basics of of what Judea Pear um, theorized and and and, and conceptualized. Um, and only when we have this causal model, we can actually purposefully uh, achieve goals. Um, it is not enough to understand that these two variables have some sort of correlation or association. I need to know which of the variables, which one affects the other, which is the cause and which is the effect to act in a, in a, in a consistent way toward the goal. Okay. Obviously, we can apply this to communication actions too, but we, this is not something we, we have done yet. And Despite they can be similar, this is not reinforcement learning per se. Um, in reinforcement learning, first of all, not necessarily you build a model of the world. Uh, actually, reinforcement learning is more interesting when you don't have the model of the world and, and you do model-free learning. You, you want to understand uh, the policy without bothering with the model. And this is you, because usually the model is very complex uh, to understand. And also another, uh, another um, notable difference is that in reinforcement learning, you have some kind of reward. Usually it is extrinsic, so it is something that depends on the task, on your environment, but there are also research works, that is a whole research thread to, to, in truth, that deals with intrinsic motivations. So um, some reward that is independent to the, to the task uh, that, the, that the agent is is doing, um, but here we are we, we are a bit in a different setting for for learning this the thing that we call sense of agency. Uh, that the, the agent should be mostly driven by curiosity. The goal is more on exploration than on exploitation. In this first level of the self development cycle, you are mostly concerned with understanding all the things you can do. So it is much more about exploration than, than exploitation. And the goal is to build this kind of causal model. Okay, so not a simple associational model, but a causal model. So we played a bit. We did some, some experiment. This is a very ugly model of, uh, this should be the model of a uh, cardboard model of a smart home that I built. So it's, it, it, I agree, it's not so beautiful, but at least it worked. Um, and basically, what we try to achieve is that uh, maybe in the next slide is, is better to understand. Uh, we imagine to have two agents, each in charge of a, of a room, two neighboring rooms connected by a window. And we wanted to let agents uh, learn many different things uh, to try to um, achieve some of the steps we have seen in the self-development cycle. So, uh, for instance, one of the first thing to achieve is, as we said, the basic sense of agency. Uh, let's assume we have some uh, light sources, the, the light bulbs, and we can, and we have a light sensor in, in, in between two curtains. Uh, I want my agent to understand how to achieve darkness. So, for instance, I can achieve darkness only if I shut down both curtains, if I have no way to act on the light bulbs, okay? Uh, if I want a, a dark room and I have no actuation capability on the light sources, uh, the only thing I can do is just shut down the curtain. And we did so with Bayesian structural learning, which is a form of, of learning that tries to understand based on data, on observational data, um, the Bayesian network that best explains the data. And after that, obviously, also the probability distributions the best explains explain the data. Then we try to build something more. What if now I can act on the light bulbs? Well, basically, now I have a choice. To achieve darkness, the low luminosity, uh, well, I have basically two, 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 two ways. Uh, either I shut the light bulbs off, in which case the, the curtain state doesn't matter, and that's what's resembled in this picture, or uh, I can ignore the state of the light bulbs, but shut down the curtains. Or 
I can only shut down the curtains of the light which is turned on. And this is all something that you can understand uh, with observational data, by learning with, uh, with observational data. So this is not reinforcement learning, this is Bayesian structural learning. And in this way, agents can learn, as we said, a, a basic sense of agency, but they can also learn the distinction between self and non-self. So they can learn, a, 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 an individual room, room in, this, in this experiment can learn that it is not alone. And there is something that is not under its control. For instance, we added another source of light that we, can, we call the sunlight. And basically here, the, 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 the room uh, learns that if there is sunlight, it cannot achieve uh, complete darkness because there is no way to, to shield the, the, the sensor which is in the center of the room uh, from the sunlight, not even with the curtains. And then we start a more interesting experiment with two rooms, so two agents, which are connected with a window. And basically, we wanted to test whether they could learn that to achieve some goal, they need cooperation. And this is indeed true. So, for instance, they learned that if they have both control over the window, so they can both decide to close the window or open the window, if they want to achieve darkness in their own room, they still need cooperation uh, with the other room. Because if in my room I turn off the lights and shut down the curtains and also shut down the window, I must be sure that also the other agent is shutting down the window because the window needs both inputs to shut down or open. And if we shut down the, the windows too, I'm okay. But if the other agent is not shutting down the window, then I must be sure that he keeps its, his, its lights off. So it's, 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 it's complicated, but it is feasible. And then we are right now starting to, to, to develop more complex uh, protocols to achieve this kind of causal modeling in a multi-agent world. So uh, in the case that um, there are different agents which share a partial view over the, the set of variables that are in the environment, and they need to coordinate to achieve, to achieve a, a global goal. Here, one of the key problems is in learning the causal model of the world, the true causal model of the world is about how to coordinate agents' actions to not hinder each other. Um, what if I want to test if, the, if this, this wall switch commands the lights? Well, I can try to switch it on and see if the luminosity goes up. But if there are other agents in the environments and maybe we are overlapped, I must make sure that no other agent is also acting on the lights. Or I, may, I must make sure that no other agent is interfering with the luminosity. Maybe someone is, is, is switching on the TV screen and, and that interferes with luminosity. And the second step will be once you learn a causal model, once your agent has learned a causal model, you should also understand how to use this causal model for, for achieving goals. And the nice thing here uh, about causal models is that unlike traditional machine learning approach, where you should uh, train different predictors for the task, with a, a single causal model, you can do prediction, you can do post hoc explanations, for instance, for full diagnosis, you can do planning, uh, you can do uh, forward or backward inference, all with the same model. It only changes the way you look at the model. So that's a very nice property of causal model. Um, the other um, trend of research we are currently playing with is that of learning communication. So as I said, we are most interested in the collective level. So uh, reinforcement learning has already shown remarkable success in achieving tasks, for instance, in isolation or requiring cooperation between agents, but in an implicit way. But what if we take advantage of the fact that agents can communicate many times in the real world? For instance, uh, autonomous cars uh, sh should communicate. If, if we foresee a future where most of the vehicles in a city are autonomous, are self-driving, we want that to communicate because that could speed up a lot of things. 
Uh, if vehicles could communicate, for instance, in an intersection, we may get rid of traffic signals because who cares about green and red when vehicles can communicate where they want to go and coordinate their actions properly. So the, this kind of research we are, we are just starting is about um, what we can achieve with communication that we cannot without and how can we learn to communicate. And in this very brief video, you can see that on the top left, you have this kind of uh, agents, which are actually like, you, you, you can think about them as, as, as the ants, that they should learn to cluster. But without communication, which is the pheromone-based communication that you see in green in the bottom right, without communication, they can't. Um, they can because they will need the positional information of every other ant to properly form clusters, but that's not available. Instead, when you use pheromone, and the, the, the nice thing is here is that Pheromone depositing and following is not an innate capability. It is not encoded in the in in the agent, but it is something they learn to do. So this is actually showing later stages of of training where the policy is is already learned. Uh, with this kind of communication, the collective goal, which is clustering, can be achieved. Uh, but yet again, I want to stress, this is not about learning how to cluster. This is how this is about learning how to communicate. In this case, how to deposit and follow pheromone. When to deposit and follow pheromone to achieve some goal, which could be clustering, which could be foraging, which could be whatever you want. Um, so basically, these are the kind of questions that partly we aim to answer with our ongoing research. So, first of all, what is the correct balance between innate capabilities and acquired one? So, uh, even a baby has some sort of innate capability, some sort of innate motion control, uh, obviously the, the, the ability to see and to hear, and to hear the, the, in the environment. Uh, so, uh, to what extent should we provide our software agents with some R-coded capability and to what extent we can rely on learning? This is something we we, we, we will have to understand sooner or later. Um, then a more engineering question is how to engineer these, these new agents? I mean, what should be this new software development process, software engineering process? Um, should we engineer multi-agent playgrounds like open simulators when I can put my agent with some of, in, of its uh, innate capabilities to let him develop some uh, learned capabilities? Um, how can we engineer this environment in a way to be uh, transferable to other domains, openly usable, uh, scalable enough to support an increasing amount of agents? These are all uh, questions that we need to answer. Another engineering problem is, um, and it is something that in machine learning is very relevant and is gaining traction recently, is how can we build modular and reusable components? How can we build an agent that is that has learned to do a task and use this as a component of a broader system that maybe use is 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 is, is striving to achieve other tasks, more complex tasks? And also importantly, how can we design the boundaries which in which alert behavior should stay for safety reasons, for instance, in critical scenarios? Uh, I don't want to learn, and it is with reinforcement learning. Believe me, it is extremely easy to learn stupid policies, stupid behavioral behavioral policies. So, how can we engineer the boundaries of what could, can, can be done and what couldn't shouldn't be done? And that is a very big uh, issue, and 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 a very also uh, cross disciplinary one is how to have all these things sustainable. I mean. The, the, the experiment I shown by DeepMind is using a distributed infrastructure of 
thousands of, of computers and, and GPUs and there are a lot of, param of parameters, there are there is lots of computing power uh, involved here, which is first not affordable by everyone. So this is basically hinders uh, the research process itself. It is extremely specialized, and uh, it is basically unsustainable even from a from a cost perspective. So uh, basically, the 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 lessons I I, I would be glad if you could take home uh, is that. There are many efforts that, as a community, uh, artificial intelligence researchers, distributed system researchers, and many other kind of, of software engineers are, are doing that can be framed in this conceptual framework of self-development. And this will be crucial for developing future systems. And in our uh, opinion, um, two most compelling, let's say, challenges are to start developing causal models, causal learning algorithms, not only traditional associ associative learning models in, from, from traditional machine learning. And the other one is to start thinking about cooperation. We should let our agents learn also how to cooperate, not only how to achieve tasks in isolation. Um, that's it. I hope that you enjoyed the talk. I know I I cannot be as entertaining as Professor Tambonali, but uh, I hope I stimulated in some of you some, some nice questions or some nice idea. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me uh, and, to, uh, and to ask. Thanks again.